All right, guys, Frank Root back with you. We're here to do another uh, step of our 22 X4 build series. This is bag D, uh, most RC racers' favorite bag for whatever reason. Uh, but this is actually going to be the shock bag for the 22 X4. And in some ways, this is my favorite bag of the build because I like building the chassis. And when I get bag uh, D done, then I have the diffs, the turnbuckles, the slipper assembly, and the shocks already. And the rest of the car goes together super fast and super easy. So while we're building up a little bit of viewership, I'm going to bring on one of my friends and a TLR racer. Uh, also works at the hobby shop at OCRC Raceway. He's the, the local fast guy, uh, Matthew Willoughby. Hey, Matthew, how are you today? I'm doing good, Frank. All right, so uh, Matt, you work at OCRC. Uh, you race at OCRC quite a bit, and you've been traveling a little bit more. Why don't you uh, tell us a little bit about your RC journey and your uh, your time with TLR? All right, I've been racing for the last six years, six seven years. Um, I've been with TLR for this is my third year now. Uh, just really enjoying their product. It's very easy to sell something in the hobby store when the card works very good. When the car doesn't work, it's kind of hard to sell, but we've had a lot of good luck with the TLR stuff selling. So it's been good, you know? Um, like I said, I work in the hobby store three, four days a week. I'm there at the track pretty much every day of the week, wrenching, working in the shop, driving, testing other things. So being able to that has definitely uh, I'd say I've gotten actually fast but a lot more consistent by doing that so I can go it just needs a little more so yeah all right Awesome. Well, thanks for uh, introducing yourself there, Matthew. So, like I said, Matthew um, is getting just man crazy fast at OCRC. I definitely don't. Uh, I don't expect to beat him on club nights anymore. That's for sure. Uh, so, uh, and had a pretty good reedy race. I think you were in a B B main. I was in the B main for four wheel and C main for two wheel. Okay. So yeah, I mean, for your first real reedy race, I mean that's excellent. I've been, yeah, I've been to four Reedy races, but this was my first time actually racing the Reedy race. So I think for the first one, I'd say I did pretty good. Yeah. So, and uh, he's definitely going to be one of the main contenders to be at the Stock Nationals uh, whenever that event does get to happen. So, yeah, hopefully, hopefully May is yeah. going to happen, but well, we'll see. That'd be awesome. So, all right, guys. So we got the uh, bag D build here. Matthew's going to go ahead and uh, add to the color commentary while we're building bag D. Uh, help with any questions that might come in and share any of his personal uh, tips and tricks to building uh, TLR Gen 3 shocks. But for the most part, we're going to leave it on the table cam now as I go ahead and get building. Uh, so first step, take my hobby knife here and go ahead and open the bag. I always cut away from myself. Uh, obviously, you don't want to get cut. And uh, here we have uh, three bags. So there's a D1, a D2, and a D3. And this is the first uh, first time we've kind of run into this where we have multiple bags within uh, within the main bag. So th the way that it works is you're going to build bag D1, and then when you're finished with bag D1, then you're going to build, build bag D2. Then when you're done with that, then you'll build bag D3. And you won't need any parts from D2 or D3 till you're done with D1. So you can just set them aside. Now, we do have an instructional step D1, uh, but generally D bag D1, the first bag of bag D, is going to last for a few steps, not just, uh, not multiple. So the step number doesn't necessarily correlate to the bag number. It might be two, three, four steps per sub bag. It just kind of depends on the part of the build and how many parts are included. So I'm going to go ahead and open this, this one up too, and I'm going to use a... Uh, rag here on the work area so you can see it's the one that we were building turnbuckles with 
black marks. So we've got our shock oil here that comes in the kit. It's 4240. I'm going to use slightly different oil. Um, so we'll go ahead and set those off to the side. Got our shock bodies, and they come pre-assembled with this lower cap on. Uh, we just do this because the threads are very fine between the two parts and to ensure that every set of shocks that you get matches and that you have no problems threading, we have them pre-assembled before they go in the kit. That way we know that the threading uh, is good. So I'm going to go ahead and just pull all those off real quick. And uh, one other thing I'll show you is with these Gen 3 shocks, you can see here uh, there's this little groove, like this little notch here, kind of in the middle of the flat spots. That signifies that this is a, a three millimeter shaft shock. The 3.5 millimeter shaft shocks don't have the groove in there. They're just smooth. And uh, that's how you can tell the difference between the two. So let me see. I, I'll actually pull one out and show you real quick. So this is a, a 3.5 millimeter shock. So you see how that, that groove is not, not there in the middle of those flats. So are you running three mil shocks or three and a half on your car, Matt? On my four wheel, I am running the three mil shock. Okay. And your two wheel? In fact, running? I'm running, I run three mil on my two wheel as well. Okay. Same for me. I know some guys like the three and a halfs, but I'm a, still a fan of the three mil. Yeah, I've been a fan of the three mil since they came out. So, all right. We got a couple shock tools here. We got some uh, white machined uh bushings and spacers there and then we have our seals and there's actually three different size seals there's a uh a large seal kind of like a uh a medium size seal which is closer to the large size but it's definitely smaller when you place them next to each other you can see the difference pretty clearly and then you can have eight of the x-ring seals um so what i do is i kind of do this assembly line style so i'll actually just grab a top seal go around the top the large, the large seal goes around the top, and then the smaller one goes around the bottom. So basically just hold one end and then kind of pull it around and get it there to the bottom. So I'll just do one shock body and then the next until I got them all done. And then, uh, Matt, you do, uh, you do builds, right? Yeah. Uh, the show. They want a car bill. I'll I'll build a. Usually for a two wheel drive, hundred hundred and fifty, and then a four wheel is usually one fifty. Eight scales two hundred. Uh, but I, I'll, I built a couple Yokomo kits. I built Nick Black's Yokomo two-wheel drive kit. Haven't built a, built a the associated kit yet. I did build a B74, though. But. All right. So now we got our seals on there. Uh, so we got our seals on our shock bodies. So now uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to get some shock oil out and I'm going to build my shocks with um, 4035. So I'm going to use the regular TLR. Well, I like using this just because especially when you get to like 40 and 35, they're colored, um, which makes it easier to tell what shock oil you had in the, the shocks when you go to rebuild them. So you can see you got 40. Uh, here is kind of the purplish and then the 35 is the orange and what I'm going to do is I'm going to take some some oil and just basically line up all the seals here and just put some oil on all of them uh, I don't really use shock slime on my shocks usually I just use shock oil it seems to work really well with the TLR stuff uh, now you have your your bushings here that go on the bottom so you have your large diameter bushings and then your smaller ones and the large ones have a groove on them and I'm going to try and hold it up here so you can see. It might be a little hard. Hopefully it'll focus. Yeah, it's having trouble picking up the focus. But anyways, there's a groove here around the outside. And that groove needs to go away from the shock body. So this is the groove side. It needs to go out like this. 
Uh, so you just want to keep track of that. What I do is I'll actually pick up all of them and put them all so that the groove goes down. And that way when I do it, I already know which direction that they go. All right, so I'll just basically pick up a shock body here. I'll put it over a seal and basically get the seal in the end of the shock body. And then I will put it over one of the spacers, one of the smaller diameter spacers, and I'll put it over another seal. And then I will put it over the spacer that goes in the bottom and kind of pick it up like that. So you have all four items in there. And then just take the bottom cap and screw it on. Whoop. And then drop it. And then just screw that on snug. And that's one. And then you just kind of go through and do uh, three more. Do you have any, uh, do you use green slime or do you use shock oil, uh, Matthew? I use the blue O-ring ring grease. I really like it. I use all of the one-up products for just about everything. Okay. Um, but that's what I use for building shocks is the one-up blue. Okay, cool. Yeah, I've heard good things about those. I know Randy Caster is a very um, detail-oriented uh, mechanic builder RC racer, and uh, I'm sure he wouldn't uh, put something out if he didn't think it was gonna. It was the right thing to be running. All right, so we get my last uh, couple in here. And if you ever um, build your three mil shocks and they don't instantly feel smooth when you put the shock shaft through there take the bottom cap off and make sure that that groove is facing up so you can see it and that it's not down where the seals are. Cause that uh, will be a problem. Uh, all right. So now we got bag D one done. Now we're going to open bag D two. And this is the shock shaft, pistons, hardware, shock eyelets. Uh, so you got some shock travel limiters kind of on this bag here. So we're just going to open all the different various uh, bags from D2 here. And what I do first, I just lay out my shock shaft. So I basically match up like longer, shorter. So I know which ones are my rears and which ones are my fronts. Um, I do kind of, obviously you can see I have the shock bodies like that already. And then you do get different shock pistons for the front and rear. So we're gonna run 1.6 pistons in the front and 1.7s in the rear. So I'll basically just check them and put them like this. I usually put front things further away from me and rear things towards me. So I'll just kind of go like this so that they're all matched up. Now I can't really get them backwards. Uh, and I'm definitely going to get out my thread lock here, my TLR lock. And a. you can use a 1.3, but I find that a 050 tends to fit these screws better. So I use a 050 still. So what I'll do is I'll take a shaft and you have this little steel washer. You put the steel washer over. Then you take the piston and you put the piston over. Now these are thin pistons and you could tell because they have um, like a taper on them and there's like a little step here on the bottom side and the number is on the top side. So I always install my piston so that the number's on the top. Uh, Matthew, your setup, so you sent me a setup for the 22 uh, X4, which should be up on tailracing.com. Uh, within the next couple of days, but you're using standard pistons in your four wheel. Is that correct? The whole of how the car drives with the pistons for how I drive, very went on oil. Oh. This uh, car was just too soft. Soft. Okay. So I do do know that. Uh, most of the team so far is liking the thin pistons, but again, that's why we have different um, different options, different tuning options, different setup options, because, uh, you know, every driver uh, drives a little bit different. And they need something uh, different to make the car work the way that they need it to work to be able to go as fast as they can. And if you've seen Matthew race, uh, you know that speed is definitely not a problem. So he knows what he's doing in terms of setting a car up for the way that he drives. Uh, so here I do have the uh, dynamite uh, shock shaft plier multi-tool and it's really nice because it has three grooves for different size shock shafts in here and then it has a hole punch and you can punch out some uh, uh, ball end out of eyelets and stuff so it's got a lot of nice tools to it but basically I use that middle hole 
tighten it down and then snug the screw down. I use a, a little bit of Loctite on these screws, but really not a lot. They don't tend to come loose. So I don't want to put too much on and, and potentially strip the screw out. So washer, piston, screw, pretty straightforward. So we got our fronts done, we're getting our rears done. Here we got all of our shock shafts assembled. Now I'm going to put the thread lock away. I won't need it again for this bag. And what we're going to do now is I'm going to take a little bit of shock oil. And you want to drop uh, just a little bit of shock oil into the body before you put the shaft in. So basically, you don't want the shaft to go through the rings dry because uh, it does have threads on the end of the shafts. So you don't want to tear up the seals. Uh, so I always go ahead and put like a little drop of oil in there first. Um, Actually, I almost forgot we need a front limiter here. One millimeter front limiter in the front to get to the kit set up for shock travel. Stroke. And then put the other millimeter on the other front. Put a couple drops down there. I'm not trying to fill it up. I just want to make sure that the, we're not dry in the bottom when I'm pulling the shaft through. And then do the same for the rear. No limiter in the rear. We're running um, pretty much not quite full, full travel, but we can run a little bit more, but we're running quite a bit of rear uh, droop stroke. All right. So we got all those done. All right. Now we're going to go ahead and put our eyelets on. Uh, now we're using the standard eyelet. TLR does have a plus two eyelet that's two millimeters longer. And you do get four of those in the tuning parts bag. But for the kit setup, we're running standard eyelets. So you won't need those plus two eyelets. And basically, I just hold the shaft to kind of get it started. And tune from there. And then when we get close to the end, we'll go ahead and set the stroke measurement. And I'll show you how we measure that. Uh, what are you running for stroke on your four wheel, Matthew? Uh, 229 on the nub. On the nub? Yes. Okay. So here on the four-wheel drive, so we, we the nub was new for the 22 5.0. And when I say the nub, I mean the top of this little... Uh, okay, so we have this little step right here that's higher than this surface. So on the 22 5.0, we in the instruction manual, we went measuring from here to here the stroke but before we used to measure from here to here so it'd be a different measurement and a lot of people were unsure what measurement to use or which measurement was used when they were reading setup sheets and i definitely regret uh making that call to measure from here to here because it just added to a lot of confusion so for the 22x4 and all future setup sheets that we post we're going to be measuring from here to here and the difference, in case you're curious, is a millimeter and a half. And for a while, at least, I'll put a note on the setup sheets about where we're measuring. Um, so for this kit, we're going to measure from we're going to measure from here to here. Uh, Matthew, you said you're running 22 and 29. So if you add a millimeter and a half to that, um, that's 23 and a half and 30.5, which is the kit stroke setting. So I'm just going to go ahead and put my calipers in here and see we're at 22.8. Uh, one thing that's really helpful here is a full uh, a full turn on an eyelet is a half millimeter. So a quarter turn is a quarter millimeter. So I always just kind of keep that in mind. So I need to go about a turn and a quarter probably to get where I need to be. So you can kind of count how far you should be going based on the, how many half turns you go and get close. So we're at 23.5. Now we're going to do the others. So, Matthew, you run some stock and some mod? 
Yeah, mostly now I've been running stock. I did run I did run for a couple months before Reedy just to get ready for Reedy, but I've gone back to stock just just to get ready for stock now. Um, but I have ran I have ran some mod here and there. Do you uh do you prefer one over the other for any particular reason or? Um, I like mod because it's definitely harder to run mod, um, but stock is what I've been running for the last four years, so I'm kind of partial to partial to stock, and I think there's definitely a better club race level scene of stock than there is mod. Mod kind of just died off. So it's hard to race people when there's no class. Yeah, no, I feel you. But if people were running mod, I would definitely run. I think it's more fun. I'm the same way. I, I mean, I'm always going to prefer to run mod, but like when I come down to OCRC to run uh, four-wheel drive, I mean, I bring a I bring a 13.5 with me because I know it, you know, if I want to race, I'm probably going to need to drop that 13.5 in for one practice. Right. For racing. Yeah. Mod four wheel club racing wise has completely died off. You don't like, we don't even get a mod four wheel heat anymore. I mean, we haven't gotten a mod four wheel heat in the last three years. Mm hmm. I mean, only the only time we'll ever race mod four wheel is getting ready for reading. That's the only time there's ever a class, but it sucks. Mod four wheel is fun. Yeah, agreed. All right, so we got these um, four shocks built with the eyelets on. The stroke is all measured. I'm gonna go ahead and pop these shock balls in real quick. I use uh, these flat blade or flat blade needle nose uh, pliers. You can see on the inside that they have uh, teeth for like half the way. And then after that, they're they're smooth in here. And I'm going to try and use the smooth section uh, to keep from the teeth marking up or scratching the anodizing. So basically, I'll put the ball in and let it sit in there. And you can kind of see it. Hopefully, I don't drop it while I'm showing you. And you can see it sitting in there. And then I'll grab the uh, smooth portion of the teeth and just kind of pop it in like that and nice and free. And the ball goes in and it really doesn't take much force. You just basically need something to hold it still so it can fall in. So you can either, you know, put the ball on the pliers and then just close the pliers around the ball. Or you can go the other way where you put the ball on the eyelet and then close the pliers. So we got all that done. And now we're going to go to, to bag D3. Is the last bag for the shock build. We won't need that 050 anymore, so I can put that away. Uh, let's go ahead and open these bags. So some people, um, you know, you might wonder why there, you know, there's three or four bags sometimes within a bag. And, uh, you know, you kind of open a few, got to open a few bags to get all the parts out for like bag D3. We, I think we opened uh, three or four bags here. The reason that we do that is because if you had all these parts in the same bag, it'd be really hard to, to look at them, to check and make sure all the parts are there. And that would be at the factory or when we do the QC here in the U.S. When you break them into smaller bags of anywhere from like six to 10 or 12 parts at the most, then it's really easy to see all the parts in the bag and make sure that nothing's missing, that everything's there. Uh, so that's the reason for that. Uh, it was a little bit more opening, but if you're not missing screws in your kits every time you build them, then you're probably better off for it. So now we have our uh, shock collars here and these even larger O-rings. They go ahead and fit right in. And I'll see, I'll try and do that closer to the camera. So you kind of just, I put one side down in the groove from the top. As it's kind of hard to do above my head here, but as I try and hold it closer to the camera, but you basically get it in the groove and then you just kind of go around and just kind of push it down. And it'll fall in that groove. I just put my finger in there and make sure it seats all the way. All right. And then I use a, 
This, I use the shock slime on these. So I put a little bit of shock slime here on the inside on the seal. Put like a little drop in there and then just kind of like rub it around. Now you can just use shock oil here. Um, I know a lot of guys do. I just like using the shock slime. Seems like it lasts a little bit longer. It stays in the seal longer and it just makes it easier to adjust your ride height. Do you use anything on uh, on your seals there, Matt? I use, I use uh, Ma uh, Maxima SC1. I like it because it doesn't make a mess. It, it, when it dries, it, the O-ring is still nice and doesn't get oil all over the body. body. Getting, a little, getting a little nice and clean, a little neater. Awesome. I use uh, I use SC1 to clean my car sometimes. Uh, it's really good stuff. It smells nice too. Yeah, yeah, it looks really good. Like, just try not make sure nobody eats it. Type of good. Well, sometimes you can't stop that. <laughs> we are we are at the RC track, so right, right. All right. So I'm just getting these guys threaded on now, right now I'm just putting on the shock collars. I'm not really measuring them um, or putting them in a particular place. Like I'm going to do that when I check the ride height after the car is assembled, it's really going to vary depending on what springs you start with, how, what electronics you have, how heavy your car is, what ride height you're going to run, what surface you're running on. So um, that's why we don't really put like a measurement in the instruction manual because it, there, there's no measurements, no, no, no measurements, right. Except for, the measurement for your personal circumstances. So how heavy is your, uh, your four wheel, Matt? My four wheel weighs 1690 to, to 1710. Depends on, depends on which I have, I have in it. Yeah. But that's with a big battery, right? That's with a 5,000 or a six, you know, and, you know, full size battery. Okay. And you prefer the full size battery for spec racing? Yeah, for spec, you almost have to use it. I've tried running a low the LCG batteries, and usually the last two minutes it fades really, really bad. So I've just put up with the big battery. That's all. That's all. That's all what I've always ran. Okay. All right. So I have the. Uh end of my TLR car stand here that I have for my shock stand. So I'll go ahead and get my uh, rear shocks here on the right side and my fronts on the left side. And I pulled the pistons all the way down. I'm going to go 40 weight in the front shocks. And I filled them like not quite all the way full right now. And then I'll come back and top them off later. And get some 35 for the rear shocks. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to basically push the shaft up until it gets almost to the top of the oil. And then I'm going to let it sit for just a second. Let Basically, you're letting the air that's under the piston come up so that it sits right below the piston. And then when you pull it down, you usually get a couple of big air bubbles that are close to the top. So they come out real quick. And you are going to have air in your shock but you just don't want to have big pockets of air in the shock and you don't want to have air mixed in the oil before you go to bleed it, I think is the important thing. So get those. We have a, we have a question from Rob Moore. Uh, do you see any benefit to polishing the shock shafts? With the time uh, carbonitride coating that we have? No, I don't. I think the coating is basically it's like a really smooth um like lubricated type coating so if you were to actually polish them and take some of that coating off the shocks would actually be less smooth so um if you're running the standard shock shafts the non uh, tie nitride coated shock shafts then yeah you can polish them and it'll help uh but it's something you would have to do on the semi-regular um the 22x4 does come with a tie carbonitride shock shafts though so now that I uh, bled all the air out, I'm going to basically fill these guys so that they're completely level with the piston all the way down. Okay. 
And then I'm going to do a start with the front shocks, go left to right, uh, just because that's how I do it. I'm going to put a couple drops of oil here in the cap because when you have a brand new cap and there's no oil in it, uh, it you know it won't have basically there won't be enough oil to fill the entire volume with a completely dry cap. So I'm going to grab another rag here and just basically wipe off any oil that comes out that bleeder hole. I'm going to take my shock tools here and the hex just fits in the, the bottom. And the top basically goes over this eyelet and just kind of tighten them up. You get a little bit of oil maybe coming out the bleed hole. And then with your shaft all the way down, just go ahead and slowly push the shaft up and get oil out. And you want to hold the shock vertical. I'm trying to kind of lay it over a little bit so you can see it better on the video. Actually, I might just do this real quick. So you want to hold it vertical and just slowly push that shaft up and then grab your 1.5 and your little bleeder screw and install it in the hole. Make sure on this that you put it in straight and you don't cross thread it. And the, the whole point of the screw is just to keep the oil in and it doesn't need to be crazy tight. I mean, you're threading steel and plastic. So then you want to take your shock and pump it a couple times. And then make sure that as you push it up, that it doesn't get tighter when you get up towards the top. And you should have just a little bit of rebound, like one to three millimeter. So that one's pretty dead. That one's good to go. So I'm going to build another one. Again, a couple drops of shock oil in the shock cap. Doesn't need a lot, just a little bit. Grab the shock. So here, I'll do this. Just so we can see the best. Take your shock and your shock cap. Just go ahead and put it on. Thread it on with the shock shaft all the way down. Take your shock tool. Put it on the bottom, on the top. Tighten it down. Okay. Now take your rag. And you want to basically hold the... I hold the rag like right underneath the bleed hole. And then kind of can't see, but very slowly push the piston up. And just let the excess oil come out and then hold it up and then holding the piston up then you then you put in the bleed screw now if you were to pump the shaft a few times and feel like it does uh get tighter as it get towards gets towards the top then all you would do is just back the bleed screw out push it all the way up to the top slowly uh, and then put the bleed screw back in. And then the second time it should be perfect. So these bled really perfect. The fronts, the first time they tend to bleed easier in the front than the rear, just because there's uh, the shock shaft shorter. You're not displacing as much fluid. So it just doesn't uh, usually require rebleed as often as the rear will just because of the length of the shock shaft. And you pretty much build your or bleed your shocks the same way, Matthew? I don't think he's in to get air out because it's in shock. And as soon as, you know, hmm. as push, so I get big bubbles out. Just as normal, and I'll bleed it twice, so I'll pump it up and then again. And after I've done, I've done the initial um, bleeding, and it to me gives the best feel on the shock. Okay. And we do have a question. Eric Lawson asked if. He sees some guys using a spring cup when bleeding. Is it necessary to do? Um, I don't think so. I mean, it just depends on how dead you want the shocks to be or not dead. And then, um, like with our with our shocks, we have the you know the step that is the same height as the spring cup anyway, so it wouldn't bleed any different with our shocks. Um, but no, it's not something we've we've never really bled our shocks with the with the spring cups on, but you can, but I don't really see a benefit to it for our shocks at least. 
the only time I've had to do it is when you run a lot of group and the piston goes above the cap or above the, you know, the top of the body, that would be the only time I would do it. Um, yeah. just to give that extra, you know, buffer. So you're not pushing the piston into the cap. Yeah. Especially if you have a piston that's held on with Eclipse, like that's an easy way to break an Eclipse. Right. All right. So we're getting our last bleeder screw in here and then we'll be ready to put the spring cups on and uh, springs and spring cups and then answer any questions you guys have. So if you guys have any questions about the 22 X4 or shock builds in particular, feel free to ask them now. Uh, we'll be able to get to all those in just a minute or two. So this shock, you can see I did a uh, double bleed. So I basically just pumped it and it was a little tight at the top. So I unscrewed the screw, pushed the shaft the rest of the way up. And I mean, like maybe a drop of oil comes out. It's not very much difference. So you can see how dead the shock builds. It rebounded maybe a millimeter and a half. And that's generally what we look for. So uh, now on the 22X4, we came out with some new uh, spacers. And let's see, I need to put these on something so you can see them. So I don't know how, well, maybe you'll see it on my finger. Basically, it's a little uh, C-clip with a tab. And these are for adjusting up travel on the outside of the shock. So without having to pull the um, shock end off, you can add these clips. And they basically just uh, snap on the shaft here and stay in place. And then you can pull them off. Even with the springs on, you can limit the up travel. And the kit setup for the 22X4, we do limit the up travel uh, all the way around by one millimeter. And we're going to go ahead and do our doing a rear shock first. And we have uh, two different height spring cups. You can see here's our high spring cup. And then this is what we consider our standard spring cup. And you can see the difference in height where the spring sits. And we're going to use the standard in the rear and the high ones in the front. Uh, now, when I build the shocks, I put the, um, I put the paint at the top the little paint mark on the spring. So I have my paint up here. You want your bleed hole to be on one side, okay? And then you need your uh, hole for securing the eyelet to the spring cup on the opposite side of the bleed screw. And then I will basically put that little screw in, that's like a pin screw, press it in and screw it in. And the reason that you need it on the opposite side is that when I put these on the car. I'm going to put the bleed screw on the top to the inside. And then this screw down here needs to be towards the outside of the car. Because if it's towards the inside, it's going to hit on the suspension arm at full down travel. And then the, the other side, I just make sure to do it the opposite way. So we got the bleed screw on this side. Spring, spring cup on. Eyelet. And then I'm going to show you real quick. You can just grab some pliers and just grab this guy by the tip there and even just put it between the coils of the spring and slide it right on. So you're all set there. We'll do our front springs. Now the kit includes a yellow front and a pink rear. And are these the springs that you're running right now, Matthew? That's running... I've liked. I've tried the tried the C8 C8 V2 V2 yellow front and blue rears, and I'm a fan of that those springs. I like the V2 springs, but for how I drive and the I haven't tried them with the standard pistons. I tried them with the thin pistons, and it was just too soft. Um, but I will go back and try them again with the standard pistons in. Okay. And then go ahead and flip this last one on. All right. So there's our shocks. We have our shocks assembled, front shocks, rear shocks, all ready to go, uh, ready to get on the car. And, uh, yeah, pretty straightforward. That's bag D complete. Uh, do you guys have any questions? Go ahead and ask them. We'll, we'll uh, take a minute here and answer any questions that you might have before we hop off.
and uh, I'm going to go eat dinner. I don't know about Matthew, but that's what I got next on my agenda. Is dinner time yet, Matthew? Uh, I don't know. I don't know yet. All right. All right, let's see. Do we have any questions? Uh, Scott Wolf said that he had a car shipped to him today, which is awesome. Congratulations. I think you're really going to enjoy it. Uh, huh. John uh, Lopededa, John L, said he got fired from a hobby town USA because he would only sell TLR products, which uh, that's rough to get fired, but thanks for selling the products. That's, that's awesome. Uh, let's see. Eric Lawson says best shocks on the market. I mean, I, I think that they're really, really good. They're really smooth. They really don't leak. Um, that's one thing else we, I should cover is we do have updated seals and bushings, uh, Matthew. Um, and they're for the three millimeter shafts. They're, they're called, uh, G three V two, uh, seals and bushings and they work together and they change the stack up inside the shock and the shocks are smoother and they leak less. So it's been a really good, um, really good adjustment, uh, that we've made and definitely been a lot better. Have your, uh, you, have you noticed that your production, uh, 22 X four shocks were better than what you had for G three shocks before? I, I think out of the package. Yes. I think once you use the old seals enough, they kind of better and better and better. Um, but out of the package, by far, they're, they're better than the 5.0 when it came out. Um, but I've been running the G3 stuff. I haven't done the three and a half millimeter shafts. And I've only had my first car I built leaked for a day. And I just took them apart and re-oiled them. And they didn't leak after that. So I've had good luck. I know some other people have had a bad, bit of bad luck, but I know we did fix it. And they haven't had any problems now. Okay. Yeah. I mean, we're always striving to try and make them, you know, everything as good as possible. And the shocks is, it, it's really challenging because you want them to be as free as possible, which means no friction, but the friction is what keeps the oil in. So it's this really fine uh, dance you try to do getting getting it to touch without dragging and keep the oil in and the air out uh but still be really smooth and to not only be smooth when they're new but be smooth after they've been used a little while so uh yeah i feel like we got it a lot better dakota's been pretty critical um you know he is very critical about how his shocks feel in terms of how you know if they leak or how smooth they are and how long the seals last and he's been really happy with the new parts so that's been good. We have a question uh, Tony from Tony Griff. Setting this car up on carpet, what pieces would you have to get that kit in the kit? Hold on one sec. All right, you got me now? Yep. All right. So to get to get a carpet set up, um, I mean, I think you can change probably springs and oil and maybe pistons, but I don't even think you have to change pistons and then um, different springs and pretty much be most of the way there. I think uh, if you go to the stiff sway bars, it's going to help for sure. Um, the carpet setup that I have posted, we do run uh, six degree front caster blocks and the low C LCDs in the front. Um, and then we also run the motor mount forward, which requires the optional set of center drive shafts. So for somebody who's looking to go to the, you know, the hundredth degree of like, what is the best, best, best setup, then yeah, you could say you should or could get all of those things. But really, I think that if you got sway bars, springs, pistons, and LCDs, you're 99% of the way there. Uh, and then you can get the caster blocks and the drive shafts to the center at a later date if you want. But realistically, it's really not that many changes other than the diff oil, shock oil, et cetera. Uh, we got a 
call it. Right. I'm sorry, you were breaking up. Uh, favorite part of the new part of the new buggy that makes it stand above the rest. Rest, uh, other than quality. Uh, for me, it's how light it is. I mean, my car at Desert Classic and Reedy Race. I mean, my car at Reedy Race, we ran a big battery, so I was like sixteen eighty five, I think. But at Desert Classic, my car was sixteen twenty and minimum sixteen thirteen. So basically, running at minimum weight with a thin lipo. And so is Dakota. And I really think that that's what makes the car jump, land, accelerate, brake, carry corner speed the way that it does, which gives it, you know, an advantage on the track. Yeah, what about you? I think uh, just how easy it is to drive. Going from the belt drive, which was far my favorite car before this car, um, what we had to do to that car to make it work. Um, was a lot. I mean, you had to cut the car up and all that. So, for me, being able to build it out and get it and go and drive it and be a lap faster than I was with my old car, that that's something I like. Well, I mean, that's one thing. Like, uh, is the car is just really, really fast. Um. You know, I won't forget that day when we went club racing at OCRC uh, and you and I were kind of battling. You ended up winning, of course, because uh, we were on a 13.5 and you're the man in 13.5. And uh, the uh, we both did 18 threes that day. And the next best lap from anyone else was a 19 one. And, you know, there's really yeah. fast drivers at OCRC. Like that's not all just you and me driving a lot of right. for sure. Yeah, for sure. So, all right. Uh, let's see, I found one more question up here that we'll answer real quick and then we'll hop off. All right. So Justin Holder, uh, why do you put bleed screws facing inwards? Didn't know uh, there was, uh, that was the way to do it. Basically I put them inwards because at least when we used to race outdoors, if you would wreck or roll over, you'd get mud in your bleed screw. Then you'd have to clean it out to bleed the shocks. And if I'm bleeding my shocks, I'm going to take them off the car and clean them up anyway. So for me, I just put them inward so they don't get scratched up, don't get dirt, clay, whatever stuck in them. Yeah, I'm in the yeah. same boat there. I do it just so I don't have to clean the screws out when I go to, you know, to take my shocks apart, bleed them, all that. It's just easier. A um, little bit cleaner look, too, if you really care about it that much. But that's... We do. We do. I do. Awesome. All right, well, uh, let's see. Thanks for your question, Justin. Um, looks like we don't have any more questions. So I just want to thank uh, Matthew Willoughby, uh, local fast guy at OCRC, and uh, getting faster and faster all the time. Thanks for coming on. I thought it would be fun to uh, fill the time when I'm you know, building some of this stuff by talking to some of our uh, team drivers and letting everybody else uh, get to know you guys. Uh, so thanks for jumping on. I really appreciate it, and I uh, hope you had fun too. Yeah, thank you. All right, guys, um, I'm going to eat dinner and then I might jump on for another uh, video later tonight. We'll kind of see how that goes. Uh, but, yeah, you know, keep poking around the TLR Facebook page. If uh, if not tonight, I'm definitely going to be doing uh, some more build videos tomorrow. Uh, I want to get through all the videos as soon as I can so that guys can watch them ahead of building their cars instead of after the fact. So thanks for uh, jumping on. And uh, thank you, Matthew. And everybody have a great day. Yep. Thank you, Frank.